Uh, good morning. It's my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stefan Hell. Dr. Hell is a Romanian-born German chemist and was awarded the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for using fluorescent molecules to bypass the inherent resolution and optical microscopy. He shared the prize with American chemist W.E. Murner and American physicist Eric Betzig. Dr. Hell and his family emigrated from Romania to Germany in 1978. He studied physics at the University of Heidelberg, where he earned a diploma in 1987 and a doctorate in 1990. From 1991 to 1993, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. And from 1993 to 1996, he was principal scientist in the laser microscopy group at the University of Turku, Finland. He returned to Germany in 1997 when he became a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry at Göttingen. In 2002, he became director of the institute. Today, in addition to leading the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, Dr. Hell is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Stefan Hell, who will give his presentation entitled Min Flux Nanoscopy Super Resolution Post Nobel. Thank you very much, Jerry, for this kind introduction. And of course, thank you for inviting me here, Chad, Nathan. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and um, I was very excited coming here because this is, of course, the cradle of nanotechnology. And this symposium is very well known, running now in the 16th year. It's time to be here and to speak about what I think uh, is interesting in light microscopy. So thank you again. It's a great pleasure. Now, um, I'm sure um, you know that in the 20th century, the resolution of any light microscope was fundamentally limited to, by diffraction to about 200 nanometers. And the best resolution uh, that one could get was uh, by taking a confocal image. Now, confocal microscopy certainly provided three-dimensional three um, resolution and uh, say background suppression and the rest of it, but didn't go substantially beyond the diffraction barrier, maybe a few percent or so. This was changed by the development of STAT microscopy, uh, which uh, I was responsible for. And STAT microscopy showed for the first time the risk, so to speak, physics in this world that allows you to get a much higher spatial resolution than what people have thought. Now, uh, STAT microscopy could attain a spatial resolution in practice that is better by about a, a factor of 10. So you see here a comparison, 200 nanometers, 20 nanometer, and a factor of 10, of course, makes a difference. And this was enough, of course, for the Nobel Committee to decide in 2014 to award the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And this picture actually is taken from the official Nobel uh, poster of the 2014 Nobel Prize. And you see um, two uh, view graphs. Uh, one is showing the principle of STAT microscopy. Basically, it means we have a beam that turns molecules on. There's diffraction limited. And we have a beam that turns molecules off. That's the red beam that is shaped as a donut. And then only molecules that reside from the, say, center part of the donut are ca capable of being on and emitting light. Now, um, I had the honor uh, and pleasure to share uh, the Nobel Prize with two American physicists, as you've heard, um, W. Murner, who discovered that you can see individual fluorescent molecules, and um, um, Eric Betzig, who turned molecules on and off individually and localized them in order to take a picture. Now, if you think about how the two methods, so super resolution methods, worked, and these two methods are canonical, if you will, they form a cornerstone of the field, they have a lot, in, a lot of things in common, namely the turning of on and off of the molecules. You separate features by making sure that two molecules or two features that are closer together than the diffraction barrier are not emitting fluorescence at the same time. So that's the, that's the basics of, of it. Uh, there are differences, of course. Um, and one thing they have definitely have in common is um, they can, in principle, attain a spatial resolution that is of the order of the size of a molecule, one nanometer in 3D, in principle. But to be honest with you, as I indicated already for STAT, the same applies also for palm storm. In practice, they don't. 
Usually you get a spatial resolution that is of the order of about 20 nanometers or so, and it doesn't get much better. Of course, there are exceptions. A number of cases, um, you can get a high resolution also with STAT and also with Palm and Storm, but not as a general rule. So, to be honest, the Nobel Foundation put it actually quite correctly. The microscopes cross the threshold of the diffraction barrier, 200 nanometers, but, and that's what I'm adding now, but did not attain the ultimate limit. So, I was interested because I always had this vision that in the end we should be able to get down to the smallest possible, say, uh, uh, or highest possible resolution imaginable, maybe the size of the molecule. Let's go about it and do it. And so I'm going to talk, talk to you um, about how we managed to attain a spatial resolution that is better by a factor of 10 compared to what has been um, uh, um, what, what was possible, say, uh, four or five years back. Now, in order to explain this to you, so that's the actual title of my talk, Attaining Molecular Size 3D Resolution um, in uh, Focusing Fluorescence Light Microscopy. Now, um, in order to explain to you how we got there, it's very, very important to have a profound understanding of the basis of, say, the field of what is called now super-resolution fluorescence microscopy of the fundamental principles. And there's a lot of confusion about how these microscopes work in practice. So I'm explaining to you now in very simple terms, and believe me, the simple way of explaining things is the actually most profound and fundamental way of explaining the field. Now, you know, the most important element of a fluorescence microscope, of course, or of any light microscope, is the objective lens. And of course, if the objective lens managed to focus the light down to a point, literally to a point, one could address individual molecules and the resolution would be truly molecular because we could address, of course, each molecule, even if they're very close, say, individually. But because light propagates as a wave, it's not possible for the lens to concentrate the light on a point, on a geometric focal point. Rather, what will happen will we get a blob of light that has a diameter that is about the size of half the wavelengths of light. And then, we cannot address just a single molecule, but we will address um, all the molecules that fall within this diffraction blob of light, shown here in green, because we assume now for the moment that we, say, use green light for, for uh, addressing the fluorescent molecules. The fluorescent molecules are shown, of course, in, in yellow in this view graph. Now, what will happen? All these molecules will produce light, and you can imagine that a fluorescent molecule also produces a wavefront of fluorescent light, which goes back to the detector, back to the, to the um, left-hand side from your uh, perspective. And then each of the molecules will produce such a diffraction-limited blob of fluorescent light, and these blobs will all overlap in space. And therefore, no molecule will be able to take apart the signal that is produced here in the detection plane, because these blobs all overlap. So the solution to the problem, and that's the only fundamental solution to the problem, and that's the key without which none of the super-resolution fluorescence microscopes would work, was to make sure that not all the molecules that are covered by the green light within this diffraction zone are in the end capable of emitting light back to the detector. So some of them had to be turned off. So turning molecules on and off has been the key to breaking a diffraction barrier. It's always very simple, at least in retrospect. Now, um, but that was clear already, already 10, 15 years back. So what we do instead microscopy is we have a dedicated beam, um, which is shown now here in, in red. This red beam is, is, say, is patterned as a donut. At least it has a zero at its center, of course. And then we turn off all the molecules here. You see that they have be turned black now as a result of the presence of this red beam, but one, say, or one feature that is right at the center of, of this donut. And then, of course, the situation gets, of course, sorted out, because now only that molecule is capable of emitting light, and then there is no, say, messing up of the signal on the uh, left-hand part, and we get signal just from that molecule, and, and then the whole system behaves as though we would have just addressed a single molecule with the green light. So playing on and off, helps us disentangle the problem that exists at the detector. 
And so this is done in stat microscopy with a beam of light that turns molecules off. Now, um, uh, say, to be more scientific, of course, we have a green beam that raises molecules from the ground state, fluorescent molecules to the excited state, so it turns them on. But the key idea was to introduce a beam that turns the molecules off, so it instantly sends them back to the ground state and doesn't allow the molecules to occupy the excited state, turns them off, and then, of course, you have only a subset of molecules in the on state, say the molecule just in the middle of the donut, and then you have um, sorted out a problem and you can address the molecules, so to speak, one after the other, or groups of molecules one after the other in the sample, and then you've sorted out the problem and you've overcome the diffraction barrier. Now, a hallmark of STAT is that we always know where the signal comes from because we inject, actually, the place where the molecules have to be off and where they are allowed to be on. So the pattern of light, the donut pattern, basically determines where molecules are on and off. So we don't have to find out the position of the, of the emitting molecule because it's predetermined by the beam. Now, that's not the case in palm storm. Again, palm storm separates features by turning molecules on and off. So th this has not changed after, um, so when it was introduced. It's the same basic principle. But the turning on and off was not done by a pattern of light, as it is done instead, but stochastically in space. So individual molecules were turned on, some, so it could have been any of these molecules within this uh, diffraction zone of about 200 nanometers in size and 500 nanometers along the optic axis, could be any of them. And that's enough, of course, for, for signal, signaling out the molecule from the rest, for making the separation, but it's, that's not enough for finding out where the molecule is, because the position here is not predetermined. And so what happens in Palm Storm is the following. A camera is placed here in the on the detection side, and the camera has many pixels, and the pixels, of course, determine a coordinate, a reference, a coordinate reference, if you like. And then under the condition that a molecule emits many, many photons, producing a pattern here at the detector, you can sort of um, analyze this detector, and it's very obvious that the center of emission, so the center of gravity of this pattern must coincide geometrically, optically, with the position of the molecule. And then, of course, you can find out where the molecule is located. People call this localization. And as I said, just by calculating the center of the pattern, you find out where the molecule is. And so the more photons you have, obviously, the better you will know where the molecule is located. If you have just 10 photons, there's a certain uncertainty because uh, the precision here scales inversely with the square root of the number of detected photons here in the pattern. And it's very clear that you need many photons in order to determine the position here because a single photon could never ever define a position or a coordinate, why? Because if this is a diffraction zone and I have just a beam consisting of a single photon, it could go anywhere, here, here, or here, no idea. But if you have zillions of photons coming, you can define a pattern and hence define a position. So the more photons you have, the more precise you will be. By the way, this applies also here. Instead, that's not much different. Why? Because if this donut, let's assume this donut would consist of 10 photons, of course I could not define a zero in here, no way. The more photons I have here in this donut pattern, the better I can define the position in here. So you see, you always need many photons to find out or to define a position in space because uh, one single photon, because of diffraction, cannot do the job. But now if you compare the strengths and the weaknesses of the two, and this is the only, say, valid and correct interpretation of the super-resolution field, then you will find, oh, which, which are the strengths? Clearly, defining the position here instead is much better done than in Palm, because since we need many photons, it's better to take the photons from the laser because the laser emits trillions, trillions, and trillions of photons. There's no shortage of photons. We can define this position with arbitrary precision, easily reach the, the Ongstrom level or so on. But here, it's a nightmare. Because here, the position is done with the emitted photons. But for essence, molecules, they don't emit trillions of photons. They stop emitting after maybe 50 or 20 or 10. They go to dark states or bleach altogether and then there's no way of localizing the molecule. So here the localization of the molecules is done with this very feeble, brittle, and, and unreliable beam of fluorescence emission, and that has set the limits to palm storm, and that's a weakness of palm storm. But palm storm has a strength as well, which is the fact that the separation, of course, is done on a single molecule level. 
And of course, if you want to attain a high spatial resolution, it's always good to separate already individual molecules, to turn individual molecules on and off rather than groups of molecules. So the strength of palm syndrome is the fact that you deal with single molecules for making the separation. The weakness is the brittle and unstable fluorescent beam. So we want to have the highest possible resolution. So what would you do? Well, let's combine in a clever way the strengths of the two. Let's turn molecules on and off individually, like in Palm Storm, but not, let's not take this camera and this localization thing here from Palm Storm, but do the localization with the photons that come from the laser, with a pattern beam. Because here we should be able to localize very effectively and then combine it and come up with a new concept which is called MinFlux, and I'm going to explain to you now how MinFlux works and why MinFlux attained for the first time a spatial resolution of one, two, three nanometers in three dimensions. Okay, for, if for some reason you, you did, couldn't follow me because you wanted to see or were distracted by my funny accent or anything, uh, there is now a new opportunity to learn something from scratch because I'm going to explain to you how it works. Now, um, usually when people think about localization, they think that they have, a, say, an epifluorescence illumination, so the whole field of view of the microscope is illuminated, and that there is a molecule and there is a camera on a, on the, in the back uh, image plane, of course, of the microscope. And as I said, what happens actually is that the camera records a blob of light, say a diffraction pattern here on, on its pixels, and then the more photons you have, you, the better you can localize. And then, um, as I said, if you have n photons, the precision is something like the wavelengths of the fluorescent divider the square root of n. This is what people do when they think of localization. If, you want, if they track molecules, they try to get as many photons per unit time in order to localize it. The fewer photons they have, the more lousy the localization will be. So we are not going to do localization this way. This kind of localization is done in without exaggeration, 500,000 labs, biophysics labs, nano labs, and, and the rest of the world, in many, many labs. We do, for the first time, the localization totally differently. So instead of doing epifluorescence illumination, what we do is we produce a donut, like instead. But now this donut beam is not used for turning molecules off, so it's, it's just it's used for exciting molecules. So, so why a donut? Simply because a donut perfectly determines, of course, a coordinate in, in, the, uh, in the object space. So the zero is very well defined. This is where there is no photons, of course. And then um, the, the donut inherently defines a position of the molecule with great precision, and the brighter it is, the better the precision will be. And how can we relate that to the position of the molecule? It's very simple. If the molecule happens to be right in the center of the donut excitation beam, there will be no fluorescent signal. So you see, we don't have a camera in here. We have a detector, like a confocal detector that measures the fluorescent that is produced by, by this little molecule. And then, of course, if the two coincide in space, the donut zero and the molecule, there will be no fluorescence. And then we know where the molecule is. It must be right at the center of the donut because there's no fluorescence coming. But if there is some fluorescence coming, now it's slightly offset, it's clear that it must be somewhere in the neighborhood. It cannot be right at the zero. And then you can imagine this information can be used to find out where the molecule is. And we just have to relate it to the position of the donut zero, nowhere else. We don't have to find, find it out from scratch. Could not be somewhere anywhere within the, uh, uh, the field of view. It must be somewhere in the neighborhood of the zero. Now, since my last name is Hell, I thought I have to introduce a little demon. <laughs> and um, like Maxwell demon, of course, the demon knows something that we humans cannot know. And this little demon kind of knows where the molecule would go if it moved. And let's assume the molecule moves, and the little demon acts on a beam deflector. And this beam deflector shifts the, the donut around, okay? Shifts it around in the focal plane. And now, because the demon is clever, it, it does it in the following way. It just make sure that the zero of the donut perfectly coincides with the position of the, of the moving molecule, fluorescent molecule, at any time. And you see what will happen? There is no fluorescent emission because the, the molecule is just, um, the, the, the donut zero is always overlapping with the, with the position of the molecule. Yet, of course, we would know in this case where 
the molecule is, because it coincides, of course, with the, uh, with the coordinate um, that the little demon uh, puts, actually, uh, or kind of imposes, actually, on, on the position of the, of the donut. So you can perfectly track, of course, in this limiting case, in this uh, soil experiment case, you could perfectly, um, currently track, perfectly track the molecule because it must coincide with the position of the, of, of the donut zero. So why am I showing you this? Because this, say, SOD experiment kind of tells you that at least in the limiting case, you can have a perfectly, perfectly precise localization without requiring a fluorescence emission. Okay? Because uh, in this situation, this ideal situation, there's no fluorescence emission coming. Still, we would know where the molecule is. So this is totally different from a normal localization that is done in palm or stone, where you need, say, an infinite amount of, of photons, of course, emitted photons, fluorescence for detected photons, in order to get the perfect position of the molecule. So this is a kind of shocking conclusion, if you will. Of course, it's just a solid experiment, but still, there's another shocking conclusion, and that's equally shocking. You can imagine that well, if it's just about matching the two points, the zero, which is a point, with the molecule, which is a point, the wavelengths won't matter. So in the end, you will see, you will get a spatial resolution in a focusing light microscope, and I'm serious about it, whose wavelengths no longer depends on, whose, whose resolution no longer depends on the wavelengths. Crazy. Imagine you have said that maybe 30 years back, or 20 years back, or 10 years back, um, in your examination, you would have failed, for sure. But we're going to show you that this is possible. Now, there is no such way of not, as having, there is no do, a demon, of course. But we can kind of, kind of mimic a demon, which is in this case a controller, of course, some electronics. And then this controller acts on the beam deflector. And of course, it gets an input signal input from the detector. So if some fluorescence measured, the controller knows, oh, there's no perfect overlap, and I have to act on the deflector. And then you can imagine what will happen if the molecule starts moving. Um, and the two, the two do not coincide, the zero and of the donut and the molecule. There is some fluorescence going on, and then the uh, controller acts on the detector, and then, of course, shifts it around to make it come very close. But in any case, the large part of the localization is now done by the, by the donut, by the photons that come from the laser. And the fluorescence that we record here is just used for refinement. And if this becomes clear to you, you will realize that we need only just a few fluorescence emissions in order to make this refinement and find out the real position, so to speak, of the molecule. And again, we, this concept shows that you can, can put the burden of localization, the photon burden of localization, on the excitation photons rather than just putting all the burden on the detection photons as it is done normally in, in uh, localization microscopy um, super-resolution methods. OK, now you will ask me, OK, so in practice, how many photons do you need in order to get a certain precision? And that's uh, very easy to answer if you do an, um, a little experiment in, uh, in a single dimension. Let's assume this is uh, x or so, and the molecule is here, and this is our, our, our donut. And then, of course, we move. We have to move this donut across the molecule in order to find out where the molecule is. And of course, at a position where fluorescence will cease, we know where the molecule is. So the profile of the, of the donut is this one. You see, this is the profile. Here is the molecule. And now we move the donut across the molecule. Of course, here, zero. So the molecule must be here. OK, I'm doing it again. It's very obvious. Now the zero of the excitation beam coincides with the molecule. Fluorescence is zero. And now we know where the molecule is. Well, in reality, you don't have to move um, the zero across the molecule. You don't have to. Because if you know that this profile here has a certain function, and in the first approximation, it will be a quadratic function, you can, it's perfectly enough to come very close to the molecule. Of course, um, it's better to be very close. It's, that's clear. But you have to be reasonably close and just measure the fluorescence taken at the two endpoints of this region L, of this distance L. So if you have n0 and 1, and you can extrapolate, so to speak, and calculate uh, the position xm. As a matter of fact, you have to just solve um, a seventh graders uh, quadratic equation. And if you do this, um, uh, say, and this is valid, of course, this quadratic uh, approximation for, for a donut in here, uh, you get the simple equation. So the position xm of the molecule is given by L. 
This is this a range in which you expect the molecule to be located, divided by unity plus the square root of the ratio of the two of the endpoints um, of the thrusts. So these are numbers like 10 photons, and this is 3 photons or something. You take the ratio, and then xm gives you the position of the molecule. Now, one thing that becomes instantly obvious is there is no wavelength dependence anymore. Um, the, the wavelength doesn't matter in this case, as, as we kind of intuitively predicted. And also, molecular orientation doesn't, doesn't matter. And this is a big thing for uh, in palm storm, and it's very often kind of pushed under the carpet. If the molecule is kind of tilted or so, or even moves, and you don't know the, mo the position, the movement of the molecule, you are off by 20, 30 nanometers localization. So the normal localization has a big error, which is due to molecular orientation. Here it doesn't matter, because what you do is basically you take the ratio of two numbers, and if there is a certain orientation, it doesn't matter how the orientation is. And so, and, and more important than that is the fact that if you really calculate now the uncertainty or the certainty or uncertainty, the, um, the precision with which you get to position xm, you will see that you have, of course, this inverse square root dependence of the number of photons. So the, the capital N is the, the, the addition of the two photon numbers that you get at the end. But the uncertainty or the precision scales linearly with the range L. Okay, and that's really important. And you're in control of that because that's, so to speak, a measure for how close you bring the zero to the molecule. The smaller L is, the, the closer the, the zero uh, of the donut is on, on average, of course, to the position of the molecule. And that is something you're totally in control of. So you can reduce L, and if you reduce L, then the, the, the precision goes up, so sigma gets smaller. And that's, of course, more effective than increasing the number of photons. So it's, it's not effective to wait for more photons to come, as it is usually done in palm storm. It's more effective once you have a certain um, so a knowledge where the molecule could be, it's more effective to, to kind of reduce the, the region L, so to bring the zero closer to the molecule. In other words, so it's clever. Once you have a, made a certain estimation where it is, you then quickly zoom in on the assumed position of the molecule and collect then the photons, and you will get even more precise. So you have a handle. And this is, this is the, the actual point here. So you can save em pho emitted photons uh, by iteratively actually uh, bringing the zero close um, uh, to, the mo uh, to the molecule. Now, in three dimensions or in two dimensions, you need more points. So in two dimensions in the focal plane, three points are enough, one, two, three. But it's better to have one in the middle because that reduces uncertainties. And of course, what you do, you, you bring the donut here, measure the fluorescence produced by the molecule, bring the donut here, measure again the fluorescence produced by the molecule, bring it here. You have another number, bring it here. You have four numbers. And then, of course, uh, the uncertainty range is the radius here, or the diameter of this range. And then the equation is not a seventh greatest equation anymore. You have to have an estimator. But it doesn't matter, because the outcome is the same. The uncertainty, or the precision, scales, of course, linearly with, with the region, with the diameter, and inversely with the square root of the number of, of photons that you attack. And again, it's more effective to, to kind of zoom in, uh, or, or kind of just um, um, uh, home in on the molecule rather than uh, wait for more, more emitted photons to come. And to be very precise and, and, and give you numbers, so these are the total number of, um, 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 so the horizontal axis, the total number of, of fluorescent photons that you need. Um, and uh, this is here for, for SBR here. This is for a camera. Um, and uh, for a realistic camera where you have signal to background ratio of 1 over 200. Uh, or 201. And um, uh, you see now um, that in our case, this min flux case, with 10 fluorescent photons, I get a precision of about 10 nanometers. This is, by the way, a measurement. This is not a fit. This is a prediction, and this is the measurement. Whereas in normal, say, palm storm localization, I would need 290 photons. Because there, the whole localization is done with the emitted photons. But here, the large burden of localization is done with the photons that come from the lasers. Uh, laser. And as I said, there is zillions of them coming. So it's very easy. Now, it shows actually the superiority when it comes to localization um, of, this, uh, of this zooming in concept. And then, of course, the better you zoom in, the fewer photons you need. But I've said that uh, many times. Now I'm going to show you pictures. Of course, you can take pictures. And don't forget, the key is on and off. 
So if I'm having several, uh, an object with several molecules, there are now stars, I have to look at them individually. I have to turn them on and off individually, like in palm storm, as I said, in order to separate them, because separation is done by the on-off transition of a molecule. Of course, I can also have just one molecule. That's clear if you want to do tracking or so. Then, then, that's, then it's not imaging, but tracking. And of course, this is also very good for tracking. So you can do either tracking or nanoscopy, so super resolution microscopy. And, and it'll be good for, for both. I'm showing you tracking first, because some people might be interested in tracking. Of course, you can track faster than anyone else, simply because you do not rely just on the emitted photons. And here, this is a, a certain protein that has been tracked with 8,000 localizations per second with precision 40 nanometers, to, to give you the numbers here. This is just the first demonstration. This is not the, um, the final, say, uh, limit, technical limit or whatever just to give you an idea of, of, of what you can do. So this is way faster than with a camera. This is 50 times, 100 times faster. In the, no way of doing it with a camera. Or uh, you can also do a molecular kind of movements uh, checks. Let's assume this is a, this is a, a fluorescent molecule here, uh, the star, and it's attached to a, a strand of uh, DNA, and it cannot move. And here it was measured, so you see, the precision was 2.4 nanometers in sigma within 400 microseconds, okay? But now let's allow the molecule move. And, um, and what, what happens now, this it doesn't move like this. I, I couldn't get a better cartoon, so it moves randomly. But again, um, the, um, uh, the distribution of localization, of course, is now obvious. So we actually managed to localize the molecule while moving, uh, and we need seven times fewer photons than what is what is the camera, CRB means camera about, so the statistical limit, so to speak, or the information limit that you, uh, that you have in the best case. Um, and this allows us to make a real trajectory. Now the cartoon is the actual movement of that molecule. So we can really make movies of molecular movements with, um, with a high precision. And um, uh, this is actually just a demonstration that in the end, this new localization scheme can also be used for, for really watching molecules at work or molecular interactions, uh, rivaling threat most likely, um, and all kinds of um, other things. But as I said, my heart is very close to imaging, and I promise you to show you pictures that are truly at a molecular scale, with a resolution at a molecular scale. Now, at the time, the 2014 Nobel Prize was given. Molecules that were at this distance here, this cartoon, 11 atoms, could not be resolved. I'm showing you a palm storm picture of those molecules, no way. Now, because we localize the molecules differently, min flux, of course, takes them apart. And it shows that you can really do that at, say, scales that are already at the range of the size of the molecule itself, say, one, two nanometers or so. Again, palm storm and then min flux tells them apart. Don't forget, it's all done with focused visible light and with regular objective lenses. And the diffraction barrier, if this is uh, the five nanometer bar, 200 nanometers, may maybe the size of the wall in here. So this is crazy. Imagine 25 years back, someone would have said, you can have molecular scale spatial resolution with focused visible light. I mean, totally crazy. In fluorescence microscopy, it works full stop. Okay, so mole molecular size resolution is essentially reached. But now, of course, of course, life scientists say, oh, can you show pictures that look like pictures, not just molecules? Sure. Um, you can take large fields of view if you want. There's one way of doing it. You scan around, like with a confocal microscope, you, and localize the molecule. If there is one, of course, you have a large scan field. And here's an example. So these are, again, nuclear pores, because these are very nice objects to study and to measure the resolution. You know, I'm zooming in, and you see the pictures look much more detailed than what you've seen on the Nobel poster. So basically, these are individual molecules here that you see, and they are individually localized. And it's very uh, nice to see the clarity. The, the sigma is of the order of two nanometers. I'm comparing it with that, which I must say won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and, and this is the confocal. I, I, honestly, I feel sorry for those people who still use the confocal, but what should I say? <laughs> but time has passed, 21st century, so you got to wake up. <laughs> and. Um, Anyway, um, this is just to show you that it also works with fluorescent proteins. So again, this is nuclear pores focused into a living cell, into a living cell, into the nuclear envelope, 
So this is why I'm saying this is now taken from a live cell. Uh, recording time still is on the long side. It's in the order of a minute here. But again, this will come, become faster. There are many ways of doing that. But the fact that you can do it is, of course, very clear and a clear incentive for engineers to sort out the rest of it. We know the principles work. And not only um, in live cells, you can do it all in 3D. You take a different, say, donut. You cannot call it donut, really, but it's like some people call it bottle beam, but I like, don't like that either. So it's a, something that has a, 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 like a halo in this direction and a blob above and below. We've used that for STAT for ages. Um, and you see the resolution here is X, Y, and Z is isotropical. So you get the same resolution in Z as in X, Y. And you can get a three-dimensional rendition, actually, of this protein uh, complex, which actually has, consists of two rings. And you see it quite nicely here. If um, the movie works, and you see there is a bottom and um, so below the nuclear envelopes and above the nuclear envelope, a ring of, of, um, of proteins. So, so cut a long story short, you get a three-dimensional resolution that is of the order of the size of the label. And of course, for those of you who use fluorescent micro, don't forget, the fluorescent microscope images nothing but the fluorescent molecule, nothing else, just the fluorescent molecules. And once the fluorescent molecule is imaged, the, the job is done. It doesn't image proteins. So if you want to know what the proteins do or what, what they are, you have to make sure that the labeling is done faithfully. And don't forget, at this scale, of course it matters what the distance is between the fluorophore and the actual protein. So you have to take things into account that didn't matter maybe 10, 20 years back. Now they really matter. The size of the label matters. It is tremendously important because, as I said, the fluorescent microscope manages to see just the fluorescent molecules, nothing else. Two colors also works if you need to relate proteins in space. Okay? And uh, this is a three-dimensional rendition that you see it's both two colors and in three dimensions. Okay, now, and then you want to see proteins in a synapse, for example, you can apply this now to the nucleus, to the vesic to vesicular synapse, and you get a spatial resolution of a few nanometers in three dimensions and in live cells. Eventually, I'm quite confident it may also work in, in, um, in uh, what is called brain slices and perhaps in the upper layer of the brain of a living system. So I'm quite confident because, because it's confocalized, it's not as sensitive to, um, to stray light as is uh, palm or storm. Okay, because you, because you can focus into something. So again, to sum it up, resolution is now at the molecular size. You can figure out that molecular movements can be seen maybe to a speed of 10 microseconds with a precision of about one nanometer, one nanometer to 10 nanometer range. This could be interesting for seeing all kinds of things. And I, in my view, people have not fully realized the potential of this. But if I was a biophysicist and I had to start a new field now, I would, I would harness this and go after molecular changes all the time, because that's, that's really, you can discover many things with this. So molecular maps can be taken. I'm sure this will come next 10 years. You will see molecular maps of all kinds of things, and also molecular dynamics mapped. This will be very, very, very interesting and useful. And sorry, I'm saying it. I have a startup company um, that, <laughs> that has a daughter company here in the United States, and this is disseminated uh, starting now from, from spring. So I learned the lessons that took quite a long time um, um, for, for many reasons. Um, uh, it's, it's quite good to have some, the former postdocs and students who are really keen on getting this done, work on it and, and getting it disseminated. Then two insights for physicists. So when I was a student in the late 80s, there was the notion that with some optical nonlinearity you may get beyond the diffraction barrier. What I'm saying is there was no optical nonlinearity used here. And this optical nonlinearity thinking actually was one of the impediments, one of the problems why people didn't get there. Because it was totally misleading, got people on the wrong track. That's one thing. And the other thing, people said, oh, you have to explain everything with optical transfer functions and, and decompose the object into spatial frequencies. Again, this is misleading and even wrong because the resolution here and dealing with the resolution and overcoming the diffraction barrier is all about molecules and molecular states. You play on and off with the states. 
and forget about the wavelengths. It's not done by focusing light. The misconception was that people thought that you have to do the separation by focusing light. Of course, in that case, the wavelength matters. But once you realize, no, you do not do the separation by focusing, but by molecular states, wavelengths goes away. And now you have a concept where the wavelengths doesn't really matter. And this is really exciting. And with that, I'm coming to my last slide. I don't have a big lab anymore, I have, but I have very good people um, to work with me, and they have tremendous contributions actually to the development. So these are PhD students they have left. Uh, she still is a PhD student with me. He became quite famous and is becoming a professor in a, in a very famous place. And uh, I'm very grateful also to them and you for listening. Thank you very much. Questions, if you would stand up so uh, someone can, can see you. And please sing, signal for a microphone. There's a question. There's a question. OK. No, it, as I recall, historically, uh, Heisenberg uh, formulated his uncertainty principle based on his doctoral question about the microscope. Is it possible to take these new advances in microscopy to gain more insight into the nature of quantum uncertainty, the uncertainty principle? So the question relates to how does this violate uncertainty principle in, in, in one way or the other? It doesn't do so. Um, because Heisberg, when he was, um, I, he was in Chicago actually, and wrote a famous book um, about the principles of, of quantum mechanics. And he actually, he actually showed the idea of localization already in that book. And, um, but that doesn't violate, of course, his principle. Um, because what you do here is um, you do not, do not convey the information on the photon, more or less. You just take position information on the photon, and not on a single photon, on zillions of photons. So that you can do because you do take the expectation value that you have for the propagation of photons. And so if the uncertainty principle is applied, and at some point, of course, it has to be applied, then it has to be applied on the molecules. And there, forget it. They are so heavy, and they are attached to anything else. You can forget the associated wavelengths. So there is no violation of the Heisenberg principle at all. There's another question. Can you please stand up so that the microphone can find you? So you showed that you don't need that many photons to localize. And I'm wondering if, even though this is like a fluorescence microscopy, like have you looked at a not very fluorescent stuff? And like, is there like a limit to the fluorescence quantum yield to do this kind of measurement? Um, actually, the strength of the min flux method is that you don't need many photon emissions because you use the, you use the fluorescent photon just for refinement, to finding out the, the latest, say, say, interval in the position because the majority of the localization is done by the donut and by the donut photons. And so, for example, you can calculate that with, with 20 or 30 emitted photons, you can have a, a precision that is, goes down to a nanometer or even less under certain circumstances. So you can make this simple, simple estimation. And there's no way of doing that, of course, if you just rely on the emitted photons for localization, if you take a pattern and take the, and take the, um, and take the centroid. Um, of course, you can apply um, this way of localizing also to scattering objects, of course. Then, then you could save, of course, also scattered photons, and, and you, you can localize faster and so on. But usually, um, scattering, scattering objects, um, they, they do not suffer uh, they, of a low photon budget, usually. But, um, but this doesn't mean that there is an application where it really, really, where such a scheme would tremendously, tremendously uh, boost uh, the application of, of tracking scattering particles. Yes, I can imagine that very well. Nonlinear scattering particles, so they are not bright, for example. Okay. Stefan over here. Yeah. It's fantastic. That uh, keeps getting better and better every time I, I hear it. Uh, amazing uh, how much you've advanced uh, the, the imaging technology. I have more of a kind of historical perspective question. So, so, so single molecule 
Um, Spectroscopy has been around for a long time now. Uh, you guys all play a central role in developing it, and much of what you talk about, and frankly your colleagues that share in the Nobel Prize talk about, is the development of the technique. If you take a step back, maybe for this audience it might be helpful, um, what are the um, biggest advances that have come out of these incredible capabilities? So you're driving and driving the, the, the technique, being higher and higher resolution, getting the ability uh, if we look back at where, you know, in today, what are the biggest advances in your eyes that have come out of these new capabilities? Yeah, Chad, it's a very good question. I'm the wrong person to ask because I have not, I'm, I didn't care much for application, to be very honest. Um, um, no, yeah, my, my, com my company does, my company does. But um, uh, at least the, the people who buy the stuff from a company, they, they care. Um, uh, so I really mean it. I don't want to say as an excuse, but I really mean it. I'm not, I'm not because I don't follow the literature, put it that way. Uh, I don't really follow the literature, what has been done with that or not. I, I only know there are a couple of thousand super resolution systems in the world. And you, if you could go to any community, cell biology, neuroscience, and they will tell you, I've seen this, I've seen that, and that. Of course, psychologically, there's no new bug that has been discovered or so, because like with electron microscopy, you could see viruses for the first time. It's, it's, uh, so the pictures usually are not so sexy because what you see is actually molecular arrangements, of course, and you learn something about the protein X and how it interacts with the protein Y and so on. But to give you one example that I think it's really, really striking um, uh, because I was kind of involved. Um, so it was seen f first by STORM and also then by STAT. A STORM in fixed cells and, and we saw it in, in, by STAT in live cells. Um, a certain actin arrangement in, um, in neurons. Uh, and then uh, Zhao Wei Zhuang of uh, uh, Harvard, she saw that for the first time in STORM, sent it to, I think, to Cell or some journal, high-flying journal. And they, they said, no, this, uh, there was a reviewer said, this is wrong because uh, I've done electron microscopy all my life on actin, so I know about actin, and there is no such thing there. And I was a reviewer too, and I said, there was nothing wrong, I cannot see anything wrong with it, and she had trouble publishing it, and I endorsed publication, and I went to the stat microscope and saw it live, and I knew it's there. And the electron microscope, you couldn't see it, why? Because the, the way the electron microscope prepares um, actin is so detrimental, that the act is not fully preserved in the electron microscope. And it's there, it was seen, it, and, and of course people have studied it. I have not taken it further much because it's not my field. But, but she saw it with storm, I saw it even in the life cycle conditions with, with that, and it was clearly discovered as a result of super resolution. Now, in her case, because her, her, her case was initially fixed, they claimed it's an artifact of fixation. But in my case, since it was life cell step, there was no question about it. And so I think this combination of storm and stat by coincidence actually showed a new organization of, of actin in neurons. Yeah, I was gonna, I thought you were gonna- This is a very on. good example where, where, I'm, where I was kind of involved. I mean, I think the, the dynamics of, of uh, cellular trafficking. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the most striking thing I've seen yeah. in terms of watching endosomal uptake and release, but, which has never been observed before at the molecular level. Absolutely, and, and your point is well taken. So I, I think a factor of 20 makes a difference or so, but the fact of 100 clearly will make a difference because, uh, because you, you can now think about all kinds of things. Like, as I said, taking maps of the synapse and so on, we've just started. And, and maybe, say, be t 10 years back, 15 years back, the gain in resolution, maybe up, up to a factor of 10, wasn't that great enough in order to really make striking, 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 striking discoveries. But now a factor of 100, this is going to be a game changer for sure. Over here, so a simply beautiful talk. Um, and you explained it so well that I feel I could fool myself into thinking I actually understand some of the physics here. Um, I was wondering in terms of the fluorophores. So what does this mean for the future of fluorophores? You show that you can use a wide variety, but is this gonna drive fluorophore development in certain directions? Yes. I think the Minflux has a much more a relaxed requirement in terms of the fluorophore than Palm Storm. Palm and Storm were basically done with two types of fluorophores. Storm basically with a, with a cyanin dye, usually it's called Alexa 647, and, and Storm with, uh, with EOS. Um, we have used those fluorophores here as well because we started from somewhere, but we do not require them. Why? 
uh, people use this Alexa 647 in storm because it emits about 10,000 photons, up to about 10,000 photons. But here for localization, we need only 200 or 300. And so it means the range of flow of force that will be available um, and that be, will become a candidate actually for this technique will be much larger. Um, and the same, I mean, it's very clear. And also there's not just EOS, uh, there will be many, many more other flow of force. And this is why I think um, uh, it'll, it'll take off. So it, many things fall into places. First of all, we use a donut, but the donut is low power. So it's 10 to 40 microwatts of continuous wave light. It's not like instead where you have a very bright beam. So, and then of course, there is little bleaching. You have the molecule in the center. Many things come into places. So it's life cycle compatible. You're confocal, meaning that you can suppress stray light. You can go deeper. So in my view, this concept is, is going to be a very, very important one for the, for the com in the coming years. Because many of the shortcomings of super resolution, for instance, microscopy that have kind of impeded uh, application in a number of cases are sorted out here in a synergistic way. Call it lucky or not, or ingenious, whatever, but that's what it is. Great. Well, join me in thanking uh, Stefan again for a fantastic talk. Thank you.